2002 was a wild year. I don't know what you were doing around that time, but I was two years old, so I was probably shitting my pants and learning colors or something. While I was occupied with that, a guy named David Rosen made a game called Black Shades during a game development contest in 2002. I forgot how I originally found it, I think it was on a PC Gamer demo disc, but it's a pretty cool game. You play as a fellow that needs to protect a very important person. Who is this important person? I don't know, but people are trying to Shinzo Abe him with guns and knives and stuff, so we can't have that. The gameplay is bare bones, but satisfying. You utilize different weapons to defend the important guy, and each weapon has a different use case. The aiming uses a dead zone or free aim format. The firearms aim isn't directly tied to your character's view. This adds to my immersion of the game. I don't really know why. It takes a bit more time to aim at a target, but it feels a bit more realistic. But yeah, you run around, punch assassins in the face, blow them up with grenades, shoot them with guns, stab them, burn them, and there's also zombies because why not? I don't know why they threw a zombie mode in there. Maybe it was just 2002, that's what you did. You had to, like in flash games and stuff. Recently this year, I googled who made the game because it just popped into my brain, and I didn't realize that Wolfire Games are the people behind it. They also made another game that I liked called Receiver. Receiver is a 2013 title that was created in a 7-day FPS challenge. On a broad level, society got fucked up by an event called the Mind Kill, and the player, a receiver, needs to fight back and survive. The game itself is deceptively simple. You need to collect 11 cassette tapes and shoot automated drones armed with tasers and machine guns. The cassette tapes play voice recordings from an instructor that provides information and instructions on how to survive the mind kill. If you recently started receiving, you may wonder why the training tapes are so important. Over the last several decades, your media has been slowly corrupted to be used against you. By feeding your mind a constant stream of damaging ideas, your view of reality has been warped to fit into a sinister agenda. This game isn't explicit as to what exactly happened to the world, but as a receiver, you had the tools to survive it. The developers released a blog post that goes over the purpose and aim of the story, and it breaks it down better than I can. What if the beliefs of a UFO doomsday cult turned out to be completely true? There's bits of religious concepts, mysticism, and survivalism interspersed throughout the tapes. I like it, because it adds a powerful sense of motivation behind your actions, and it gets the player pondering about life, societal systems of control, media influence on individuals and collectives, and all that fun stuff that is just joyous to think about. What this game is probably the most known for are the firearm mechanics. In most games, firearm handling consists of left-clicking to shoot, right-clicking to aim, and pressing R to reload. This is not the case in Receiver. You need to be able to load the magazine with bullets, insert the magazine into the pistol, rack the pistol, disengage the safety, aim the firearm, shoot it, and then hopefully you hit something that you were aiming at. Every firearm handles differently, as the mechanics of each firearm is different. The 1911 Colt and Glock are just about the same as they both involve magazines, but the Glock can go fully auto, and the Colt has a safety. The revolver is a bit different due to the cylinder aspect, so you gotta spin that thing, put the bullets in, and slam it shut. Don't actually do that in real life, you're not supposed to slam it shut, you have to lightly close it. It's kind of a complicated thing, because a lot of media shows it as shooting the gun is easy, but reloading it is the hard part. The actual process isn't complicated, but when you're getting chased by a flying robot with a taser, you learn to do it pretty quick. There's also a flashlight that comes in handy. It improves visibility when aiming or searching for ammunition and cassette tapes. You'll be doing some running and jumping in this game as well, and running is different than what you're used to. Instead of holding shift, you have to mash the W key repeatedly. Time for a controversial opinion. Oh my god! Normally I don't like robotic enemies in games, because they can be boring, strong, bulky, and bullet spongy. But Receiver doesn't have this problem. The enemies have different electronic and mechanical systems that you can damage individually. So with a well-placed shot, you can disable cameras on turrets, their ammunition supply, their propellers, and other parts. 
The soundtrack to the game is dynamic depending on whether the player is engaged in combat or not. Synth arpeggios play along with some bit crushed drums and low hanging pads, intermingling between each other as the player clears room by room of this strange facility that doesn't make any goddamn sense. Every enemy makes distinct noises, which helps the player identify what they're going up against. A loud beep noise plays when you're spotted, and a lower pitched beep noise plays when the enemies return to their normal state. The firearm sounds are spiffy as well. Each chunk, click, clank, and bang sounds pretty cool. The graphics, on the other hand, look like they were done in about seven days, which is probably about right. That being said, I don't think the graphics actively detract from the experience of the game. All of the pertinent items and entities are identifiable, and with the graphics being so bare bones, it runs well. It's also an indie game from 11 years ago, so it's important to keep that in mind as well. The game is actually so old that the website references Steam Greenlight. Remember that? So yeah, uh, it's a cool little game. It takes a unique concept and creates an interesting gameplay loop. And I played it for a long time, not a long time, probably like eight hours or whatever. Uh, but it was really fun, I liked it. And that's just like my opinion, man. I also played Receiver 2 this year. Before we get into Receiver 2, if you think the first game looked interesting, I'd recommend going into the second one blind, as it is very similar, but it has multiple surprises that I'll be spoiling. Receiver 2 came out in 2020, but I bought it in 2024 during the SUMMER SALE! Buy it now! Buy it now! Get it while they're hot! It takes the original Receiver and polishes its core concepts to create a more immersive and interesting experience. The story and aesthetic are generally the same, but it expands upon these two things to create a more cohesive vision. And the gameplay is a lot different too, and let's take a look at how it's different because it's kind of cool. We wake up and we are on the prowl for more of those sweet, sweet cassette tapes to ascend. And I'm not joking when I say ascend. The game has different levels that you can progress and regress to depending on if you get the tapes or if you get shot and tased to death. I like this because it breaks the game up nicely. In the first game, 11 tapes is a lot to get in one shot. Receiver 2 breaks this up into three to five tapes per level. Each level has a bit of a different tone and different level designs and music and it adds to this sense of progression and there's story implications that we'll get to in a bit. Just like Receiver 1, the environment doesn't make any sense because art museums are next to construction scaffolding and apartment buildings and manufacturing facilities. It does offer more opportunities for cover and elevation differences, which adds a bit more variety. It's nicer to look at at least than those blocky ass gray rooms everywhere in the first game. The higher level you achieve, the more threats there are. The game starts you at the lowest level with only one weapon. As you start to ascend, you unlock more and more weapons that the game selects for you at the start of each level. Let's talk about the weapons. Like the first game, there are semi-automatic pistols and revolvers which have different controls for their operation. All of the mechanics in this game, however, are modeled, rendered, and calculated, as opposed to the first game where only specific parts were simulated. So, big difference in the firearms in this game. Colt 45. This is the quintessential two world wars gun. The Colt doesn't have a large magazine, but it does the trick. But man, I don't even really have an opinion on the 1911. You gotta have an opinion. I mean, do you think that God came down from heaven and stopped it? Detective special. The yeah, album was dim, only illuminated by the electrical blasts of lightning during the rainy night. My revolver was stirring in my jacket, ready to aim at the threat when it was time and BAM! I find that the revolvers are easier to handle and reload when you're under pressure. They also don't jam or suffer from other types of malfunctions that could happen in this game when a bullet gets stuck in the ejection port or whatever. Guns can also jam, look out for that. Glock 17. 
Glocks are fairly unique in their design. In the context of Receiver 2, it's the only pistol that lacks any type of safety mechanism apart from the revolvers, so it can be easy to blast your whole cock off in a cracker barrel. It also has a fully automatic mode, which you are never going to use, because it's just fucking crazy how fast this thing spits those bullets out. Beretta. If the Beretta is good enough for John McClane and the Doom guy, it's good enough for me, by God. It's got the same vibe and mechanics as the other semi-automatic pistols, but it has that cool Italian look to it that you just can't get enough of. It's like looking at a linguine or something. Dangle. This thing is big, and you can blow holes in anything. That, that's about it. Smith and Wesson. This thing is pretty cool. Uh, it's easy to use, powerful, it does the job. Like, this is probably my favorite one if I want to actually beat the game. Yeet cannon. I can't believe I said that. The post-ironic Gen Z language is being utilized by the threat, and the threat's propaganda has infiltrated budget firearm manufacturers. The Yeet Cannon is cheap, American-made, and polymer-based. It can be purchased for around the price of 45 Whoppers. What a deal. P226. I like the P226. Cult Single Action Army. When Curly Bill rolls into your town, or when the threat is surveilling your area, the Colt Single Action Army Revolver can blast them away. This gun is fucking nuts, but the trade-off is the very slow reload process. If you're running into flying drones, you have to be mindful of how many rounds are chambered, and if you can reload it fast enough if you're out of bullets. The gunplay in Receiver 2 has a lot more consequences for the mishandling of firearms. Here's the thing about loaded guns, they're dangerous. You can't just whip a loaded gun out without being careful, otherwise you can... I just fucking shot myself! You need to learn to hold the holster button instead of tapping it to avoid that. I've definitely had my moments of yelling FUCK after I lost a toe or a finger, or perforated my thigh with a 45 caliber round due to this mechanic. I'm not a Navy SEAL in real life, but I don't know why receiver guy keeps their finger on the trigger at all times. Even I know not to do that. You gotta have the discipline, bro. Fucking discipline is what keeps you in shape. Motivation only goes so far, bro. Gotta work gotta your mind, mind. As, a receiver, as a receiver, you gotta be strong. Lift, 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 If you run out of ammunition, you aren't entirely screwed. With your weapon holstered, you can hack devices to disable them, but the trade off is, you need to get close to them, and you can accidentally set them off if you don't do it in time. When you have no bullets and you're hacking a drone, it's scary as shit. There's moments where I was like, oh fuck, oh shit, oh fuck, oh. It's, it's actually insane how nervous I got when I was doing this, because you have to sneak right up next to a flying drone, it's bad. It's also helpful to be able to blast a turret's magazine or a camera and then disable it. The thing about hitting the turret's magazine is that sometimes there can still be a bullet loaded in the chamber of the turret and you can still get shot at, even if you have the magazine disabled. This game is a jump scare generator. You can silently stalk through multiple areas without seeing a single enemy before hearing a loud beep coming from somewhere you weren't expecting, or if you accidentally fire your gun, or turn the corner and you see a flying drone in your face. It's scary. You can be, you can have four tapes out of five, and everything's going fine, and one bullet can kill you. The player's movement can be shitty though. Ladders are awkward to mount and dismount, and it sucks to die when you fall due to clunky controls. Because it's not really your fault, because I can climb a ladder in real life, but my fucking stupid ass guy jumped off. There's some more variety on the sound front, with a focus on ambient music this time around. The soundtrack has different tracks for each level, and it gets progressively more ominous.
That being said, it has one of the better safe themes I've heard. Thoughts flow in a sequence, and by inserting harmful media into your life, your thoughts can be hijacked. Once you are behaving in a reactive state, you will spread these contaminated ideas to others, allowing them to degrade more people. Practice basic media safety. Control your information environment. Act, don't react. When you find all the tapes in the level, a soothing song plays akin to something like Resident Evil safe rooms. It's hard to describe how satisfying this is after having multiple close calls on a single level. The firearm sounds, again, are slick. The chunky metallic clicking and clacking and sliding and the explosive blasts as you fire at the threats is so cool. It's so cool that your character flinches at how cool it is, but you can actually disable that in the options. But when you shoot, you blink, kind of like in real life if you're not familiar with guns and stuff. Not me though, my eyes are wide open all the time because I took off my eyelids. <laughs> The graphics are much better this time around. We need less of an imagination to fill in the gaps of endless gray rooms. The lighting is what really sticks out to me. The blue and yellow lighting from the automated drones and turrets contrasts with the fluorescent lighting of the hospital areas. Construction lights have this yellow haze and dim rooms. In later rooms, pitch black areas become a maze of blue lights stuck in a constant search for you. Always aware, always alert, always looking for your receiver ass is gonna blast you into Swiss cheese or whatever. The flashlights you stumble across offers a shining light blowing out everything else. It's handy, but it also allows enemies to see you from further away, so you gotta be careful with it. So the gameplay for Receiver 2 works and it's functional and it's pretty fun. But what about the story? So before we start talking about the story, there's some spoilery things we'll be talking about, but there aren't really secrets to spoil necessarily. To buy into the world of Receiver is to buy into the lessons it is attempting to teach the player at every moment, and it's cool to keep an open mind. Nothing has fundamentally changed since the original Receiver. The mind kill happened, and receivers need to stay alive. The lore is expanded upon by more audio cassettes and floppy disks. The floppy disks contain anecdotes and snippets of information from other receivers. These are scattered around the levels randomly and give some more lore exposition. The game still has the themes of survival, mysticism, and media control. The variety of cassette tapes is higher in this game, which is good because the game's original 11 tapes got repetitive, which was kind of the point because it burrowed into your brain better, but I like the extra variety they added in this one. The contents of the tapes is actually useful and informational. I learned some stuff about firearms that I didn't really learn before. For example, this one tape says this. To aim a firearm correctly, you must be familiar with the sight picture, uh, how the sights look when they are lined up correctly. Handgun sights almost always work in the same way. You line up the front sight in the middle of the gap in the rear sight, and make sure the top of the front sight is level with the top of the rear sight. If zeroed correctly, the bullet should hit right at the top of the front sight at the zero distance, um, usually around 15 yards. For maximum accuracy, you should focus on your front sight even though it makes the target look blurry. There's no point shooting at a crisp target if you can't tell if your sights are lined up. I looked at some military training materials for pistol shooting and sure enough, it does mention this. These tips are useful for in the game and in real life. There are also a choice other few tapes that I found insightful. The Glock's most controversial design choice is the lack of external safety switch, relying entirely on its three internal safeties. Glock made this decision because Austrian soldiers carried pistols with an empty chamber, making a safety switch redundant. If your gun gets jammed so badly that you can't even pull the trigger or, or move the slide into battery, you might have a double feed. This happens when the extractor fails to remove the spent cartridge from the chamber at all, and the next round is jammed up against it. Humans are curious creatures, always hungry for information. The threat has found a way to turn this strength into a fatal weakness. 
they force feed us from a fire hose of narratives designed to agitate and demoralize us, leaving our minds exhausted and crowding out our own thoughts. They divide the world into false dichotomies and demand we choose between obvious lies. To become a receiver, you must reject this choice. Some of the tapes you come across are bad news. The contents of these tapes are hopeless and depressing. This is my last will and testament. Whatever's uh, left in my bank account can go to my dad. He can decide what to do with it. Um, to whoever finds this, uh, just put my body in the trash. It's where I belong. These are called threat tapes, and you have to do whatever you need to do to render your firearm inoperable. Unload the bullets, dump the magazine, just make it not dangerous to yourself. And this is a real thing that people need to do. Sometimes is you need to store your ammunition separate from your firearm. Just the ease of access to it, fully loaded, can prove to be the tipping point for many people. Depression and suicidal thoughts are a very serious topic, and the tone of the game doesn't make light of it. While the mind kill in the game is fictional, multiple themes of the game can be applied to our information age society. Receiver's story isn't explicit with the meaning in what it entails, it's one of those games that is up to an individual's interpretation. The receiver's journey is one of repetition, training, drilling, reactions, actions, and patience. Our modern world and the technology that the average person has is unlike anything else known in human history. Millions of years of human evolution is meeting exponential technological growth within a minuscule time period. How do we maintain our humanity, individuality, and stay true to ourselves versus forces beyond the average person's understanding? How do we protect ourselves from this potential threat? I think that Receiver 2 has some good answers to these questions. The threat in the context of the game, for me, represents listlessness, depression, suicide, lack of action, negative thought cycles and reactions, media control and propaganda, and anything bad, you know? Receiver talks a lot about realities A, B, and C, and you fight their threat in reality B with firearms while you build your mind tech in reality C, and maybe even reality A, depending on your own particular religious or spiritual beliefs. Mind tech can be boiled down to the ability to question authority, recognize danger, and maintain control over oneself. Reality A is described as a metaphysical existence that we have. This could be seen as the soul. Reality B seems to be the game of Receiver 2 itself and the world that generates for the player. Reality C is the real world and the one that we are currently living in. In Receiver 2, you will be listening to the same tapes again and again. These instill the training into your mind for realities B and C. By the time you listen to all the tapes in reality B, you will have surmounted a difficult challenge. You have ascended to different levels of your own self and are ready to take these lessons into reality C, our own world. The more knowledge an individual acquires in life, the more questions we have. I feel that the levels and receiver generally follow this pattern. The more we learn about the state of the world, the worse it can seem. The first two levels in reality B are not very dangerous. The city background seems calm. You're the only one readily affected. Level 3 has lightning and thunder exploding occasionally. It's a darker world. Level 4 has the city on fire, it's chaotic and the most difficult, and level 5 is dawn, ready for the player's awakening. By the time the player is at level 5, they have listened to dozens of tapes hundreds of times, destroyed numerous enemies, and mastered the gameplay mechanics. The final three tapes are an affirmation to this fact. When you collect the final tape, you listen to it, if you accept that the threat is real, and that reality A is the true reality, then you are ready for the final insight. We have sent you this message to warn and prepare you, and you have listened. In reality C, you have sat in your chair at your computer, yet in reality A, your astral self has struggled and overcome 
many challenges. Open your mind's eye to see the mind tech you have built. They are heavy and intricate with each component perfectly formed and in its right place. Functional, resilient. You stand ready to use these tools against the threat. In order to awaken, you have to accept this final insight. These struggles in Reality A are real and have fully prepared you. Reality B has been this message. This message was a systemic process. This process was an initiation. You have completed this initiation. You are now a receiver. And the game closes. Receiver 2 is fictional, but it can be applied to our reality. The threat referenced in the game represents the worst parts of humanity, the hidden malice, misleading information causing our entire species greater pain. The audio cassettes offer practical advice. It provides tools and mechanisms to help prevent yourself from being taken advantage of, misled, and propagandized against. Being able to suss out motives for social media posts or deciphering the underlying meanings for statements and products. The game is a blueprint that you can apply to take steps to improve your own life and the health of your community. Acting instead of reacting. Focusing on what is important and tangible. Strengthening interpersonal relationships and being able to connect with others. These are important things. It's what makes life worth living and worth fighting for. Are you ready to hear the message to start building your own mind tech? Then check the game out. Conclusion. Well, that got kind of serious there, but let's get back with it, okay? So, Receiver 2 can be a frustrating experience at times, but with patience, repetition, and mastery, it shows that you too can be a receiver and gain the knowledge to question and be self-sufficient. It teaches and shows the basics of firearms handling in a well-constructed way. It offers legitimately good advice on how to approach and view social media and the media in general. I ultimately enjoyed it, and I'll probably replay it every now and then. If you think it looked cool, give it a shot. Just be sure to leave the safety on. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you want more wacky, fun, and zany videos. I'm currently aiming for a monthly release schedule, and it seems to be working well so far. Have a good rest of your day, or go to bed if it's late.